Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 28. This is God's word. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart (coughs) and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and that there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. By his grace and mercy may it be preached for you. You may be seated. And as we come to consider this portion of Holy Scripture, let us pray for God's help. Almighty God, we are thankful for your word, and and we are thankful for its instruction that we might be disciplined to know how to walk with you, to know rest. And as we are thankful for your word, we ask that you might illumine us by the work of your Holy Spirit to understand, treasure, and apply what it teaches, especially as we think about this command of love. Overcome the deficiencies of the preacher, they are many. And bless the reading and the preaching of your holy word to bring forth fruit in our hearts, to love you more, to serve you better. We ask it all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, For one of my classes in seminary, one of my professors promised a a study guide for the the final exam. Now, I don't think professors have to do that. It's a kindness when they do, but it's, it's really nice to have some direction in considering what the the kind of most important facets, the the most important points to take away are, especially when you're being examined on it. Uh, And the odd thing was, when we got this supposed study guide, it, it just said, well, you're responsible for knowing the Bible, the class lectures, and the assigned readings. Yes, I, in fact, had guessed that without this supposed guide. It didn't really narrow things down in the slightest, right? I I had assumed that those were the areas where I knew questions that would examine my understanding would be coming from, and I was hoping for some more specific guidance about what kind of questions, what what are some particular areas. And this, this study guide went holistic, directing us back to the, to the whole picture, the big picture, rather than the details. And in Mark 12, 28 to 34, we find a, a similar sort of circumstances as Jesus engages this question that the scribe asked about the law. Uh, looking for a study guide of sorts, the scribe asked what the most important commandment is 
is. And rather than going for a specific command isolated from the rest, Jesus opted to emphasize the big picture. He brought out the command that included all the other commands as the implication for how to live out that one precept. Jesus' response was that the basis for keeping God's law holistically is love. First, love for God and then love for our neighbor. And we need to think about how that heart-level mandate to love relates to the moral law's concrete commands. After all, Jesus said that love is the most important command. We need to think about how love for God relates to, well, our love for our neighbor. Are these two commands fully ranked? In a, in a hierarchy that kind of as one excludes aspects of the other? Or is there a more integral relation between them and everything else that God's word spells out as our moral responsibilities? So this passage then has a lot of implications for our life of discipleship with Christ. It helps us to think about what it means to come to Christ to learn and to seek direction for living before the Lord. It helps us to think about what grounds the contours of the Christian life. And so, the main point is that love love manifests in the specific righteous deeds of God's moral law. Love manifests in the specific righteous deeds of God's moral law. And our three points today are inclusive, inspiring, and imaging. First, let's think about inclusive. So this passage rounds out a, a series of confrontations between Christ and the, the leaders of the religious establishment. So as, as chapter 12 began, Jesus taught in parables as a way to prevent the, the antagonistic public from understanding his message. In, in verses 10 to 12, he, he cited Isaiah 6 to, to show how Israel would by and large reject the Savior when the Savior arrived, causing all the, the hearers to, to leave him. There, there's an irony that the, the religious, these religious leaders rejected Christ, walking away from him, because they got mad that he told a parable that depicted how they would reject him. So that they were mad, they were mad that he said they would reject him, and so they rejected him. The following instances, uh, as chapter 12 progresses, provide examples of how they rejected him. Right? Not, not, not in a disinterested rejection, but actually in full-bore antagonism. The, the first example showed the Pharisees and the Herodians try to trap Christ on a political issue. And, and the second example showed the Sadducees try to trap him on a theological issue. And now the three groups that composed the, the ruling religious council called the Sanhedrin were the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. And in the passage before us, uh, the events unroll how the, the full religious establishment responded to Christ holistically. Right? So the final party of the religious council has a representative come to question Jesus. Now it's interesting because so the, the final party is the scribes. The Pharisees have come, the Sadducees have come, and now the scribes have a representative. And it's interesting that 
as this scribe took a more positive posture towards Christ than the other two groups, it might be noteworthy that unlike the other parties who came in groups, this scribe came by himself. He comes with a more genuine question, and the point is that although the point of of this event in the narrative and, and highlighting this lone scribe is that although the majority of the people rejected him, Christ would be received by a remnant, by a few who would accept him for who he truly is. And this scribe was truly impressed, it seems, with with how Jesus had answered the others. Now, it's not clear. It doesn't seem like he was trying to trap Christ like the others had. And so charity assumes that he truly wanted Christ's insight about this issue. And the scribe asked, which commandment is the most important of all? You know, if, if I had to guess, I, I would think that most of us have probably asked this sort of question. There, there are two ways, however, that this question can balance. Sometimes, sometimes we are helped by structuring, by organizing, by prioritizing various obligations, right? We we gain direction and we gain focus as we order our responsibilities. It's one way that this, this question and answer could balance. On the other hand, sometimes people ask what command is the most important because they want to dispense with the obligations that they now find a reason to deem unimportant. Well, I really just need to do the the most important and can set aside the things that are less important. And I think it's good to pull at that a little more because we live in an age opposed to law. At least we live in an age opposed to moral laws. Many, admittedly, many may want to legislate every aspect of life, which means lots of, lots of laws. We live in an increasingly litigious culture. Ironically, that's because there is just as widespread an opposition to morality. People have, people need to legislate policies to get what they want because there can't be any appeal to moral principles when we've denied right and wrong as real categories. And the the point to all that is when people are opposed to moral principles, asking a a question like this about which law is most important might be meant to create an excuse to dispense with our other moral obligations. If we're keeping the most important rule, what's the big deal if we're not coming through on the less important matters? And that's actually why Jesus' response here is so applicable, so useful, so helpful Because love isn't separate from our other moral responsibilities. In fact, love is inclusive of our moral responsibilities. It's inclusive of them all, right? And that brings us to think about how love does relate to our moral obligations. And so that brings us to our second point, inspiring, inspiring. So what we've done so far is, is just note the function of this event in Mark's developing narrative. Uh, and that's to show that the rejection of Christ was not exhaustive, as if every individual refused him. This lone scribe showed that all was not fully lost, despite the several instances where the religious establishment proved Christ's claim that the heart of heart would reject him. 
And because this event is more positive, as Christ answered the scribe's question, we ought to think more fully about the content of Christ's lesson here too. As someone came to him to learn, he taught them. And so we ought to be interested to come to Jesus to learn and to hear what he has taught. And so the question wasn't a challenge to trap Jesus, but but opened the door to beneficial reflection. And what we see is that Jesus' answer gets to the very principle of the law in in that it shows us not a not a full blown ranked ordering of which commands to keep before the others rather his answer shows us which command if kept properly will result in keeping the other more particular instructions outlined in God's law if you love God and your neighbor the right way well, then you'll be keeping the other details of God's moral law. In other words, love summarizes. It's not, it's not separate from, it summarizes the whole law as our response to God and to our neighbor. Now, before we, before we dive into how this might shape our, our thinking and our living, I think we should note how our our shorter catechism picks up exactly what Christ was doing here. And this this helps us get some clarity, and it also helps us see some good reflection that we own upon how these passages work. So Westminster Shorter Catechism 41 and 42 deal with this, and they ask, the first one asks, where is the moral law summarily comprehended? So, it's asking, where can we find a basic outline of the moral responsibilities that that we are obligated to keep as those who bear God's image? Where can we find an outline of those moral obligations? And the answer is, the moral law is summarily comprehended, the moral law is summarized, right? Moral law is summarized in the Ten Commandments. And because the the Ten Commandments summarize our basic moral obligations as as God's image-bearing creatures, well, we see why Christians have long cherished them as as guiding our Christian walk. they, they, They provide... The study guide, so to speak. And so then the Westminster Shorter Catechism, the next question asks, you know, it's it's saying, well, we've got the sum of the moral law. What's the sum of the Ten Commandments? That's the question. What is the sum of the Ten Commandments? It says, the sum of the Ten Commandments is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. And with all our mind and our neighbor as ourselves. And so we have here how, well, the Ten Commandments give us a digest of the more expansive moral obligations we have. And then this rule of love is a summary of the Ten Commandments itself. And Jesus, what Jesus is doing here is he combined citations from Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Uh, and Leviticus 19.18, to show us the deeper operating principle in our hearts, namely love, that, that grows into the practical fruit of obedience to particular aspects of the moral law. Now, we see, now we, we can see here how Christ's answer really does undermine uh, any attempt to, to rank one virtue to the exclusion of, to rank one virtue to the exclusion of other responsibilities before God. 
Right? That, that's the danger that we have to be aware of. The, that, we could, that we could take one thing that we're supposed to do and use it to get away from the other things that we're supposed to do. Why, why is this... Why am I belaboring this? The, the advertising tactic of our day is love. The stance of supposed love is used to enable and endorse all sorts of behavior that is contrary to God's moral law. All I have to do is drop the slogan, love is love, and you know exactly what I mean. Because everybody, I, I watched, everybody recognized that phrase. And that phrase is trying to leverage love to the exclusion of our other responsibilities before the Lord. As if we can disconnect them. And, and the trouble here, the, the problem that we have to understand, I mean, young people in particular, Young people in particular, listen, listen to this. If you zone out for all the rest, listen to this. You will face this in school, in culture, as you grow. The problem here is the, that people have assumed what love is based upon vague sentiment, irrespective of concrete moral responsibility. I've got love, so that excludes anything else that I need to do. And that's a ploy. It's rhetorically effective, as we can see in, in the wider world. But it has no teeth if you take the lid off of it. Because love ought to be manifesting in our other moral responsibilities before the Lord. For Christ... Love is not separate from God's law, but summarizes God's law. Love is the umbrella category, and the other points of the law provide examples of how to love. Right? You've got ten really pointed ones. Ten examples of what it looks like to love God and neighbor. God's moral law summarized in the Ten Commandments explains in practical terms the way in which we ought to be loving. So, when I was in high school, uh, I built model airplanes. Um, and I had this little work table in the basement, so when I'd be going off to, to my work table, I could say, I'm going to work on building a model plane. Could tell you that. Or, I could say, I'm going to glue together some landing gear. Now, if I tell you I, I'm going to go work on the model plane, I've, I've given you the big picture of my task, right? That's what it looks like, all things considered. If I say I'm, I'm going to glue together these little pieces of landing gear, I'm telling you the specific thing I'm doing to build the plane. Make sense? I may have just made it worse. Um. <laughs> the point, the point is that this relation between love, of, love and, and God's other moral commands is intrinsic, right? You can't, you can't blow apart love and the other ways that God tells us what love looks like. You know, I could tell you I'm loving, or I could tell you that I'm honoring my father and mother. The second thing is just a more, spe that more specific action is just a way of telling you how I'm loving. Not something other than loving. And that means that when we love God properly, when we love God properly, we will be keeping his commands. And that's why Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's not a condition. It's not if you love me, well, then now I've got the guilt trip to make you good. It's if you love me, that's going to look like keeping my commandments. 
So keeping God's commands out of, out of love for him is grounded in our identity as those made in his image. God's law is a summary of his character. When, when we read or, or watch um, you know, a story about the character who most inspires us, we want to be like them, right? We want to emulate bravery, integrity, fortitude. And because that story motivates us to, to try, to strive after those things that are noble and good. And God's law presents us with who God is. It describes what he's like. We don't lie because God is truth. We don't murder because God is life. And so love is just reflecting God's character by keeping his moral law. Since the moral law shows us what God is like. It shows us what we were made to be like. And it shows us what we should want to be like. So God's character, as, as described in the moral law, is d- inspiring for how we ought to be. And that brings us to our final point, imaging. Imaging. Um, we we, we kind of hovered more around how love for God manifests in keeping his commands. Um, But loving our neighbor is grounded in the same principle. That's what we want to think about here. Loving our neighbor is distinct, but not separate from loving God. So it's distinct, but not separate from loving God for two reasons. For two reasons. First, We can't separate loving neighbor from loving God because our neighbor bears God's image. Our neighbor bears God's image. My son Scott looks just like my grandfather, whom I loved deeply. And that Scott bears the likeness of this man who meant so much to me makes me love and cherish Scott all the more. So I'm reminded of someone else every time I look at him. And your neighbor bears the likeness of God whom we are meant to love and adore with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so, since our neighbor ought to remind us of God, even when they don't act like it, they are his image bearers, and and so should resonate with thoughts of God in us who know the truth. It's a qualification we probably need. Since our neighbor ought to remind us of God, we, we ought to love them all the more because we love God. Love for God trickles directly into our love for neighbor. The commandments that tell us how to love God are not of a a completely other category from those that summarize how to love our neighbor. They run together. Second, second. Loving our neighbor is distinct but not separate from loving God because God himself loves your neighbor. If you love God, we, we love what he loves because what he loves is, is good to love. No, no matter what ways your neighbor rubs you the wrong way, whether that neighbor is a fellow church member or someone in the world outside, 
It happens occasionally that we get bothered with each other in the church. We can admit that. So regardless of how your neighbor rubs you the wrong way, God loves her or him. God made that person to bear his likeness. And we see then that imaging God as his image bearers means loving God and loving our neighbors. We reflect God who loves our neighbors by loving our neighbors. Now, we always focus at this point on how Christ died to forgive your sins. And we'll do that too. We need to keep in mind, though, that Christ died also to forgive your neighbor's sin. The crater of reconciliation was made by Christ slamming not only into you, but by making a hole that encompasses all who trust in him. And that means that Jesus has indeed given himself to reconcile you to God directly. And in that way, he will teach us how to love God. But he gave himself to reconcile you to everyone else whom he saves as well and so teaching you to love your neighbor also as we increase in imaging him we learn that love we learn that love that we that we should can and will give not because we first loved him but because he first loved us and gave his son that we might be redeemed from the curse. That the Lord Jesus would keep this command and every command in our place. Would pay the penalty for our sin that we might be forgiven. And has written our names, your name, in the Lamb's book of life. Let's pray. Father God, we're glad that you, our loving Father, are indeed our Father. That we can call you by that family name. It is so easy to get discouraged in our own attempts to love. We get bogged down in frustrations and things that weigh heavily upon us. We don't always do well at this. But, Lord, we do seek after you. That you might remind us of how you as our Father have made us brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus. And love us, shower us with your love in Christ. And help us to see that as you have first loved us, It's good to respond by loving you. What else could we do? And it's good to respond in your love for us by loving our neighbor whom you have also loved. And so as we think about what it means to to love people in the world and what it means to walk faithfully according to your law, help us to see that these things are bound together. That, well, your commandments describe what it means to love someone. And help us to rejoice that the Lord Jesus has kept all of those commands for us because he loved us. And so let us celebrate his life and all of his work for us, especially as we come to this table. We ask it in his name for his sake. Amen.